Welcome to the latest episode of Thinking Tackle. I'm Ali Hamidi, and as you can see, you're joining us in beautiful autumn sunshine. We're at the Nunnery Lakes Complex in Norfolk, and my special guest is carp catching extraordinaire and great friend Tom Dove. We're currently plotted up on the D Lake, which is one of the syndicate lakes on this venue. So the first thing, we're gonna have a look at location and spot choice. Now then, carp catching legend, how are you? All right, mate, you? Nice to have you back on the show. Yep. Pleasure to be back, is it? Yeah, it's nice. nice. Yeah. Pressure's on though, isn't it? Al? It is, yeah. It's a little bit different to where we've been previously because yeah. we always like to go to a few lakes where you're going to get lots of bites and it's yeah. quite interesting. But here, it's a bit of the unknown, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, we both haven't been here before, have we? There's, I think there's 70 fish in the lake. Um, it's not easy. Um, but there's lots of big ones in here, so I think we're going to sort of try and stick it out and see if we can catch a good one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've got the option of going over to one of the other lakes as well, haven't we? The, yeah. the E Lake over there is joined up with, uh, I think, is it Bobby's? So they've caught. Yeah, so that's a that's an option to go there and maybe catch a few on zigs or something like that. But it would be lovely if we could each nail one of the big ones that are in here, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be. Yeah, I've seen the pictures of the fish as well. They're gorgeous. So I think it's worth um, it's worth trying to catch one. Um, it's a lovely lake, but like I said, we haven't been here before. We'll give it a roll. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the swim that we're in. You're in this one, it's called No Name? Yeah, it's called No Name. I think it's one of the prolific swims of the lake. I think it's done at Fish at the Weekend, so the bailiff said it's worth going in here. We didn't really have anything else to go on, so... Um, it's the middle of the lake as well, isn't it? So yeah, it's always nice to be plotted up centrally. Yeah, yeah we've got middle of the lake, I've got an island to my right hand side, and there's a bar that runs parallel with this bank all the way down the middle of the lake. Yeah. Um, and it sort of turns into a little bit of a U shape, the bar does. So, so just by that island, yeah. well, it sort of bellies out away from you yeah. and then cuts back into exactly. the island. So in line with the island, I've got a little bowl of silt, which is probably nine foot deep, which seems perfect for this time of year. Um, I've got two rods in there and some, and some bait. So. so how did you find the spot to start with then? Did you um, use a float or did you use a bare lead? No, how yeah, I used a bare lead, I used my spot rod, just put a lead on it cast out, felt the bar and then just dragged this side of the bar um, and felt it down into the deeper water. Um, and then I clipped my rods up to my spot rod, same distance. Oh, okay. So is it quite a sheer face drop, was it? Because uh, to say you pulled it off, so it wasn't it literally, you pulled the rod up and then did it just suddenly fall slack and then into the no, deep? I could feel that it was, it was just smooth gravel all the way down. So I'm getting, it's not, it's not like a sheer, like a war. Anything. Yeah. Um, but I felt it gravel, gravel, gravel. Um, and then it sort of, Slightly, you know, sort of smoothed off at the bottom where it hit the silt. And that, that's where you've, that's where you've put what? Both rods or just one rod? Um, yeah, I've got both rods at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the bar in the silt, sort of, because because the bar goes like that around. Um, I've got my left hand rod slightly further, but it's still directly at the bottom of the bar. So, wait and see. And also, it, there's only two rods on here, and we were both discussing that earlier. That uh, I, I think up until November, it's two rods. That it'd be lovely if you could have like two maybe on that spot and one yeah. somewhere else roving because when you don't know the lake that makes it quite tough doesn't yeah, it? Yeah I always like to put two rods on one spot just in case one isn't sitting right um, so obviously when you do that and put two rods on one spot you haven't got the chance to try something else which is a shame but that's the rules of the lake and um, it's just the way it is. Yeah well, we've done one night already yep. um, got here no bait's gone out or anything like that. We put our bait out yesterday as we started. There's been no pre-baiting, nothing of that sort. So we're sort of sucking and seeing, aren't we? Yeah. What, going forward, um, you know, if nothing materialises in the next hour or so, what, what plan have you got? Um, I don't know. I, over the other side of that bar this morning, they were fizzing and, fizzing and showing. So um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put more bait out tonight or during the day, uh, maybe reel in for a little while, have a walk about, get a feel for the place. Um, put my rods back out on the spot tonight and if they're over there again tomorrow morning early doors then I'll reel in and go and flick singles at them or something see if I can get a, see if I can nick a bite but reckon I'll be hanging on your coattails mate do it yeah do brilliant it. well there you go this is Tom swim we're gonna have a look at my spots and my swim location now well this is the point swim every lake has one on this occasion, I'll give Dovey first choice because the last time we did a thinking tackle together, I won paper, scissors, rock. No paper, scissors, rock this time. He's got in there. I'm in this swim called The Point. And basically, as you can see out there, it's a lot of open water. But as Tom described, there's actually a bar that runs along this central belly of water. It sort of bellies out there, cuts back, and then goes into that narrow part of the lake. And what I've actually done is the first thing was put the float out. I found the top of this gravel bar, which was about four foot deep. I've then gingerly pulled the float back, pulled it down until I could feel it tap, tap, tap along the gravel that you get with that braided marker rod, pulling it back down until it hit that smoother, firmer silt as I pulled it there. I popped the float up and it was 11 foot deep. So what I did there was with the float on the surface, put the line under the clip, and then cast it back out. So on this occasion, with 11 foot, it's gone 11 foot further out. At that point, I've then 
let more line off and it was seven foot deep on that spot. So I pulled it back a little bit and then popped it up again and it was nine foot deep. So if you can imagine, you've got a bar there, so five foot, it comes down to seven, nine, and 11 in that firmer silt. So my rig is somewhere up there. So just on that seam of gravel. And when I've fished gravel pits and lakes with a change in topography on the bottom, it's always been really, really good to fish on that seam. You know, you can imagine fish coming along that bar, just on that shelf, and my rig's in position there, there's a chance of ambushing them. And basically last night I put probably about two key of mixed bait out there to get them accustomed to the spot. But I think the rigs went out straight after and it was all a bit of a rush. So what I'm gonna do now is actually bring my rods in, prepare some bait, put a load of bait out there and actually keep the lines out of the water for the remainder of the day, probably until this evening where I'll be more confident that the fish have had a chance to feed on the spot and build up a bit of confidence. That's been a really, really vital bit of uh, tactical now that I've used on different lakes in the past. You know, when I've gone to smaller lakes, it's really paid to put a bit of bait in and keep the lines out so that those fish can have a free feed really without any rigs in position. Let them build up in confidence and you'll have more confidence when you get the rigs out. So it's time to get some bait prepared, get that spot in. Right, so I'm just gonna chop my uh, boilies in half, a few of them to add into this mix that uh, I'd prepared earlier. We'll have a look at that shortly. I'm just putting a, the last few in here. So I've got some half baits to go with the whole ones that are in this mix, just to give the fish different options and different sizes so they don't become accustomed to any particular size out there. And um, that's one of the things I always favor when I'm fishing for tricky carp, to have lots of different sizes out there. So let's uh, get in there and mix this up a bit. Right, you can have a good look inside this bucket. I'm gonna bring out a big old handful Right, as you can see here, we have got the old sacred golden grain, a load of sweet corn. Um, some of the underwater filming that we've done in recent months proved just how awesome this bait is um, and how little I've been using it over the last few years. So it's definitely become a staple part of every bait concoction that I put out there. I'm a big believer, again, off the back of this underwater filming of this buffet theory that I've you know, started to call it. Basically, giving the fish lots of options to get interested in. Rather than just, say, using just sweet corn or just boilies, why not put in a mixture? So if there's not a lot of nuisance fish in the lake and you're fishing a carp only water, if you like, similar to D Lake on Nunnery, I've got some 14 mil um, cell and hybrid boilies in there. Also a lot of halves in there, some crumb in there as well that I've put through the mill, through the crusher. I've got some response pellet in there, some ellipse pellet in there. So real oily flavors. What I'm, why I put them in two reasons. One is to stodge the spod mix up a little bit for when I put it out in the Sky Raider. The other reason is also to get them slicking it up. When fish move over the spot with pellets in the mix, you tend to see that they're there by big oil slicks coming to the surface. The water will flatten off over your spot, and that's what I'm trying to do here, to see when fish are coming to visit the area. So we've got some hemp in there also, um, and that's it, a real nice mixed bag of bait out there to hopefully get the carp interested. Certainly when it's tricky, I think having a variety is important because if you get, say, a few vegetarian carp, as I call them, coming in, some of them just want to get started on a bit of corn. Normally you find the real big ones love the boilies. So if you get those smaller ones starting to compete, they go back and the next thing you know, like we've seen on underwater filming, they bring back their bigger mates who get stuck into those boilies and the crumb and the halves and everything else. So a real mixed bag and just before I'll do it, I had a, a fair dollop of some corn twist liquid into this as well. This does two things. It lets off a very, very subtle sort of green color that's uh, almost fluorescent, but you know, I don't think the carp can recognize that. To them, it already looks like there's been fish in the swim, stirring it up. But also it releases off a, a lovely, sweet, tasty aroma into the swim. Something they've not really seen before in this country. It's a definite edge definitely really gets fish interested and uh, that just adds a new twist and a new dimension to, to what was already a very very good bait mix so that's it what I'm going to do now is get this in the swim let the swim rest and uh, go to plan B Well, we mentioned Plan B and here it is, me and Dovey on the opposite part of the lake than where we're actually fishing. 
Tom, we've been seeing them show here all morning, haven't we? Yeah, to be honest, as soon as I've got around here, it looks better, doesn't it? The wind's pushing in here. They've been showing for probably three hours now, haven't they? It would have been ideal to come around earlier on, but obviously we couldn't. But put some bait over on the other side, come around and flick some singles up and give it a go. Exactly. We're going to let those spots breathe, like we said. So why, while we're letting those spots breathe, we might as well come over and see if we can uh, catch an opportune monster or two, Let's maybe. Hope. Let's hope. Right, well, these rods have had a good three hours out there for a bit of a stalking opportunity. But, uh, ironically, since we cast the rigs out, we haven't seen a single fish show in the area like they have been. So, giving it a good go. I'm going to get back to the swim. I've seen a little bit of slicking up on the spot. You know, just as I said, I put the pellets in to maybe give me some sort of visual evidence that there's fish in the swim. There seems to have been some evidence of that, so I'm going to get back over there, get some fresh rigs tied, get the rods out for the evening. Right, I think it's the end of time round here. We've been here for about three hours now. Um, the fish stopped showing as soon as we put the rigs out, really, so we'll give it a good go. Um, I'm going to go back round to my swim, flick them back out on the spots we had put them bait out earlier on, and settle in for the night. So. See how it goes. Okay, so after being over there for a few hours today, I've now returned to my original swim that I put some bait out in earlier. It's starting to look a little bit better around here, to be honest. It wasn't looking great last night but um, I put some bait out this morning, well, last night and today when I left. Um, I had all my rods clipped up, so they're ready to go back out, tied them to new pop-ups, put them out there, set the bobbins and, and wait for the evening now. So hopefully something happens. Wee, go on, son. This is what we've had to resort to. <laughs> Have a look at this. Good morning. And uh, to occupy our fishless time here at the moment, we've had to resort to catching these little perfections in miniature. A successful spawning, and this mirror carp will hopefully, well, this one's not going in the keep net, it's going back in there, will hopefully grow on one day to become a monster one of the monsters that this lake holds. Um, it's been a real tale of woe up till now, you know, no action. Um, Tom and I have uh, really fished hard, you know, we've persevered on the spots. We haven't actually seen a fish this side of that infamous gravel bar that's out there. Um, and Tom this morning has moved over to that far side just with a couple of rods again, similar to what we did yesterday. And um, there's been bits of activity over there, a few fish showing. So to make the most of his time, he's shot over there to just maybe have a couple of hours at them. We've got about another hour and a half to go here because people have said this swim particularly, the point can produce up to around 11 o'clock and uh, we'll give it till then. And then it was always the plan to go over to the E Lake and uh, Bobby's down the other end and hopefully um, try to catch a few fish on different methods, um, different styles that you can apply to more prolific lakes that some of you are fishing and hopefully catch a few fish from the nunnery fishery and then come back to here this evening and try to snare one of these monsters out. It has been hard. We have fished really well, to be fair. We've tried a lot, we've moved, um, the bait's been accurate, we've let the swim rest. We've done everything we can possibly do that's in our current power um, to, to catch one. Up till now, there's been no luck, but you never know, it might turn. Um, we're still hopeful and we'll keep on trying. Well, it has been 
Hashtag epic. <laughs> epic, <laughs> fail. <laughs> epic fail. Exactly. It's been a, a, a quite dramatic morning um, with no carp. We uh, moved round to Bobby's, um, which is a part of the E Lake now as the two are joined together. Um, shot up here, Tom, didn't we? Yep. Got the zigs all clipped up, spotted some uh, munger out there, a bit of cloud and everything else. Um, there was a few fish showing. But it was pretty clear very early on that the, the movement of fish was very slow, Tom. Yeah, they were too slow when they didn't really seem interested in food at all. was putting spot out, they was ignoring it. Um, it just sort of seems like scratching time now, doesn't it? That, um, any, anything you do with any amount of bait isn't particularly going to work. We're going to have to try and nick a bite somewhere. Well, this was always supposed to be our banker move. Coming on to here in the days, having a bit of fun, catching a few fish. But one thing I noticed very early on coming onto here was the amount of blue-green algae that seems to have popped up. And what that tends to do is sap a lot of the natural oxygen that's in the lake. Um, and that's noticeable in the way the fish are behaving. From some of the lakes I've fished in the past, I remember some very prolific lakes coming to a total standstill when that type of algae popped up. So, Tom, do you think that's been a, a factor? Uh, well, it certainly looks like it, isn't it? I can't see any other reason why they'd be acting so slow and disinterested. I mean, it's September, they need some food. Um, it just seems like it's got in the way a little bit, but uh, at least we tried, mate. It's, it's during the day and it would come down there, give it a good go. And that's the type of thing you should do when you're scratching anyway, to so try a different method, maybe a different lake. It hasn't worked, but we've lost nothing. No, absolutely. We've, um, we've had a plan. We've come down, spoke to some of the other anglers on this lake as well. Um, been looking around, trying to find them elsewhere. Tom's even gone down a swim and chucked a bottom bait at what looks like some fizzing carp. Nothing. The other anglers are catching nothing. So, I think even after this was supposed to be a banker, we're going to return back to the D Lake yep. and just put all of our efforts into trying to catch one of those big ones, everything we've got in our locker now, yeah, definitely. put it into that. I mean, we, the, the two swims opposite us, we've seen fish both mornings, haven't we? So we're going to move around there. Um, the swims that we've both moved around in the mornings, the last two anyway, um, move around there and see if we can catch one out there. Absolutely. So currently, hashtag downer. <laughs> Going forward, hashtag up for it. Absolute the end of filmable light. The grueler of all gruelers. We finally had moves that <laughs> both happy in swims. Fish showing. First time in two days. And uh, the man I call the walking carp, Tom Dove, in a swim that suits him down to a T. Not the biggest one in the world, but he'll do. Go on, lad. Right. Do you want me to salmon swoop? <laughs> go on, go on. Yes! Get in, lad. Get in. What? <laughs> Get in, my son. Look at that. Oh. That'll do, won't it? That will do, mate. That's what he's done on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Well, Dovey. <laughs> What can you say? I'm not the biggest bigger. carp in the world, mate, but how happy are you? It doesn't matter, mate, how big this is at all. This has been so hard to catch this one. It means so much. Brilliant. There were so many people helping weigh I think it's £16.10. Yeah, that's good. That's good for me. But it's lovely. What a journey to get to this point. I know, it's been up and down. All like early one, how depressed were we? And then now, just a completely different story over the moon. We've been lining up trees to noose ourselves from, but <laughs> I, literally a few seconds before we had this take, I saw the first one head and shoulder in three days over my actual baited area. Seen them swirling out in that area. Dovey, we're going into this night feeling proper hopeful, aren't we? Yeah, it's the first time I feel like I've been fishing. There's loads of fish about them massive in here as well, so I'm really, really excited. <laughs> Two happy chimpanzees going into tonight. Let's get it on. Well, good morning. 
Um, I'm pretty battle weary now after a couple of hard days down here. Really has been hard, but yesterday evening was the first time um, that I felt I was actually on fish. Uh, I had one nose out over my bait, um, quite a few swirls which suggested the fish were really high up in the water. I had the zig out there for a little while and then just as that mist and that cold weather sort of set in, killed it stone dead, didn't see another fish after that. Um, but my old mate Dovey, that left hand rod that we both fancied in that swim, um, casting down to that out of bounds area has, uh, has done him another bite first thing this morning. So um, I'm going to send you around there so we can go and have a look at that beautiful carp that's uh, languishing in the landing net right now. But for me, I've got a real feeling that it's going to be my first ever blank on thinking tackle. But you never know. I'm going to keep on fighting, keep on believing, and something might turn. But Dovey's produced the goods once again. Well, they are getting bigger. Dovey Abig. 25.4. 25 right. 25.4. And uh, this roared off at about 7 a.m. just before the cameras turned up. Yeah, just after light, yeah, 7 o'clock left hand rod down the down that little channel in the shallow water, job done. Yeah, because you'd cast it right under that tree, hadn't you? And you yeah. were like, you were getting a bit, I suppose, uh, you know, disheartened it and gone all night. Yeah, but I, I don't think that was there all night. I think this morning when the sun's come up a little bit, they've taken a mooch back in there and uh, this one's taken a bait. Right, I know your arms are not that big, so we'll yeah. just keep on chatting. You did mention it is shallow under there, isn't there? Yeah. Now, when we reflect on the fish that have been caught while we've been here, yeah. the captures have been out of shallow water, haven't they? Yeah, five foot or less, really. I think it's probably the higher pressure. Maybe we should fish zigs all the way through. Um, but it's only something you learn, isn't it, by, by being here. So um, I'm going to move my rod to shallow water if I can find it. Um, and hopefully this one will go again. Yeah, yeah, well, you've got it back out there on the money, haven't you? Yeah, um, we'll have a look at just the amount of bait you've been using and, um, and obviously the rig that you've had this little baby on. Yeah. So that's probably what we're going to do next. And hopefully our hopes are going to carry on lying on this young man and that left hand rod. Well, a chance now to talk to Mr. Tom Dove about the rig he's using, because here is the naked chod and here <laughs> is the man who pretty much invented it, didn't you, Dovey? Well, I think there's a lot. Oh, oh that, little I ducky. Think, I think there was lots of people that have done a similar sort of thing, but as it is now, yeah, like that. Take that. take some credit, my son, because you you from talking to you back in the day when you were fishing the Essex Manor and stuff, yeah, um, you had devised this. Obviously, the chod was no sort of uh, new method, but it was with lead core and it was on a heavy weighted setup. This was to be fished critically balanced yep. and beautifully, wasn't it? Yeah. So so. Talk us through how you like it to behave first. How do you like it to, to sit on the bottom? How do you like it to sink? Right, okay. Obviously, because there's no lead core on it and you've just got the line, you're using the putty that you're putting on the swivel to sink the bait, um, which means you can critically balance it, basically. So it will sink very, very slowly so down show, to the bottom. So hold that bait up and sh give me an idea of how slowly you like it to sink um, in. Sort of like that. Yeah. So almost yeah. as if you've cut like a quarter of a boilie. Yeah, it's just, just sinking slowly on top. Yeah. Because obviously you're, you're fishing this on top of any any rubbish that's on the bottom. So you want it to sit on top nicely. So you don't want it to sink really, really fast or anything. Yeah, burying down. No. Is there a time when you might use it sort of pinned and nailed to the bottom? Um, I'll use it with lead core and when it, and pinned to the bottom when I'm fishing a long distance. Because I don't with this you can get bow in the line and it might you know pull tight in between weed beds and it can easily pull it off the bottom. Um, but when I'm fishing relatively close range and I can see what's happening, then I'd always always um, choose to fish this one. Now, in this particular situation, to be fair, that where you're casting it isn't actually that choddy, is it? It's sandy and... No, it's, it's, it's sandy. There's a bit of weed on the sand as well, and it drops off a little bit into a bit of weed. And I'm not 100% sure where it's landing, so um, it's a big fish rig as well, so, uh, you know, a two-inch pop-up, so hopefully we can... Get, get one of them on that. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, well, let's talk about how you tie it up now because um, you've got a couple of new components on here, haven't yep. you? So I presume um, the first thing you do before you actually tie the rig is um, slide this onto here? Yeah, I slide the, the tapered section on first, it's tungsten. Um, it just slides up nice and tight on the line. Um, and that bead goes over that after you've tied the rig. So That's like a no trace system, isn't it? So most other beads in the past have been solid, haven't they, all the way around? Yeah. But this one has got a cut in it, so in the event that you get a crack off or, or a fish cuts your line, yep. that bead pops off. just pops off there and can fall off the line and that choddy can just slide over it with ease. So the fish isn't tethered, isn't carrying a rig. Um, that's really, really important. And do you wet that bead, Tom? Yeah, I make sure I wet it before I put it out. Obviously, it's in water anyway, but if you put a bit of saliva on it before you cast it out, 
you know it's definitely going to come off um, if the fish t you know, has to pull that side of, of the lead. Okay, brilliant. So that's done. Um, let's talk about how you tie the choddy up because that's a really short one, isn't it? And they do take a little bit of finesse and practice to get yeah. right, don't they? Yeah, it's quite intricate, but once you start tying them, you, you get used to it. It's quite easy. Um, basically, it's a knotless knot, so you're, you're sliding the, um, the mouth, trap. mouth trap through the back of the eye, whipping up five or six times. Um, and where you'd normally have your hair coming out at the end, that's the part that forms your D. So you put your ring on what would normally be the hair, um, and then you push it back through the back of the eye, cut it nice and short, and then blob it with a lighter, okay. um, and that forms your D like that. So um, do you leave it, but before you blob, do you, I presume you leave sort of four or five mils so you don't end up burning the filament? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll cover it with my fingers. I'll so it. I'll make sure I don't burn it, yeah. Okay, watch um, yourselves at home, kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I'll cut the, the rest of the filament nice and short, and then just tie a two-turn blood knot onto the swivel so you can get it nice and small. And because it's so stiff with a two-turn blood knot, it doesn't slip at all, it's nice and safe. Yeah, it's like sea fishing lines, you know. If you ever go sea fishing on a boat, you'll see some of them, you know, big game anglers, they'll use a one-turn blood knot and a massive hook to fish for sharks or marlin because it's so stiff, they just pull it down solid and it just locks in position. So um, don't be alarmed, it is, it is stiff material and it will hold. And it definitely holds, yeah. Okay, so that's on the, that's on a size 11. Size 11 ring swivel and then yep. a little bit of dark matter putty around the swivel to sink it. And you just measure that the amount of putty is based all around how quickly or how slowly you want that to sink. Yeah, I mean, I do it now because I'm, cause I'm cutting these baits down a little bit. Yep. Um, I'm putting the same amount of putty on every time, going into the edge, cutting a little bit more off the pop-up until it sinks nice and slow. And then this is an interesting little bead. Most beads in the past have been rounded. This one, has, uh, has got flat, sort of almost flat sides, hasn't it? Is it mm. so that everything sits a bit more streamlined during the cast? Yeah, it's just a, it's just a barrel shape. It's to make sure that people know what it's for and it sits nicely on the side. It doesn't kick your swivel out. If your swivel kicks out like that when your cast, your knot can slide on your swivel. Yeah. You end up with sort of a kink chod. So okay. um, as long as it sits nice and flat, flush with the line, um, you get you get a perfect shot. A very, very small detail, but I bet it does add a percent yeah, to the game. Yeah, everything makes a difference, doesn't it? Right, and then just moving down to the lead end, I'll just peel this silicon back. You've got what looks like a quick link there. Yeah, I've cut the swivel off of my lead um, and just put a quick link on the bottom there. It's so, basically so I can take it off at the end of the session so I don't have the leads banging around. And if I want to change the lead size um, to cast a little bit further, I can do so. Okay, and and any reason why you'd have silicon as opposed to say like a heli sleeve or something like that? Uh, no, just they're, they're made for the job to cover them quick link, so it fits over it nicely, doesn't slide off, um, and just uh, adds a little bit of cover. Yeah, and I, I suppose does it does it give you because it's it's got a bit of a cushion factor when you're playing a fish when that all pulls down, yeah. does that give you anything with it like will, a heavier lead? Yeah, it will give you a little bit, but but the main thing is is that you have got a small lead on in the first place. There's no point in putting a big lead on. Um, put a little tiny lead on, you've got a little bit of cushion there as well and you don't ever have any trouble then. And you touched on the tension in your line earlier, you said there's a chance that uh, with, with a naked shod, you know, when you're talking about lead core or naked, um, line tension, how tight should you have your line when you're fishing a naked shod? Very slack, very, very slack. I always make sure that as soon as, I, as, soon as the lead hits the bottom, I slacken off a lot in, in the, that first 10 so seconds. So it all just falls down Yeah, nice. so that can fall down. Even if you check it in the edge and you've got a bit of a tight line and then you let it go, um, the, the line can get caught on weed that's in between the lead and your rod tip um, and it doesn't sink properly. It won't sink properly in between weed beds or whatever. So um, make sure you, it's, you slacken off straight away. The pop-up will then sink onto the bottom and then don't tighten up after that. Just slowly put it onto your rest, fish a nice yeah. slack line and perfect. Yeah, if you, if you tighten up with a rig like that, you're going to end up pretty much like that, with a chimpanzee type yeah, effect. It's, it's sitting two or three inches off the bottom of the line is, and that's not what you want. Yeah, exactly. And then it, it, it looks totally unnatural, and that's a, a, a surefire way to a blank, I'd say. Um, and then finally, you again, you did touch on that bait's cut down. Um, it's pink. You've cut the edges off. Yeah. Um, I've seen you doing a bit of trickery, mate, with that. Yeah. Um, I know you've got a, a special bottle of liquid that uh, has served us all very well. We've seen it on the indeed, underwater yeah. film. Um, Stuff. Yeah, so that's a bit of like almond liquid. Yeah, well, uh, th this was originally a yellow pop-up to begin with, and because I've put so much on the outside of it for, for the attraction, yeah. um, it's gone pink. And then when I cut the sides off, obviously it shows the yellow on the inside. Um, and, and the rough edges are sort of a perfect place to put this because it sort of grips onto the edge of it. So I'm cutting the edges off, putting a little bit more of this on the outside. Um, Go on then. Like this. Show us how much you're putting on. 
like that. Just a little bit like this, and then rubbing it in like that. And, and I've found with this, if you if you want it to last longer, obviously Tom's been hydrating these hook baits, so he's he's added them and kept applying a, a thinner version and then a thicker version on the outside. The thinner one cuts into the bait, the thicker one sits on the outside. And if you leave them in dry heat, you'll get this sort of, that liquid basically just attaching itself and holding almost like a bonbon on the outside. So you get much slower leakage rate, don't you? Yeah. When that goes out wet like this, it sort of comes off quite quick, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It gives that taste, that colour, that aroma, like a little halo around your hook bait. Totally unique, something um, that's been never really seen in this country, has it? Mm, not until now. Yeah, yeah, not until now. Um, and you've had really quick bites, haven't you? Yeah, one, one went literally as I put it on the rest yesterday, so that's obviously working for me, putting it on the outside. Um, and then I had a bite as well that I'd put out last night and, and had a bite this morning, so obviously the stuff that I put on there um, previously worked as well. So it's had longevity and short-term effects. Yeah. Well, there you go, an absolute masterclass by the Naked Chod Master. Well, 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 who would have thought it? About five minutes ago, me and my mate Steve, who's been the greatest help on this shoot, we'd noticed a few fish fizzing in here and it was the last resort. He had some maggots on him, so we got a few maggots, put it on a little gooed up pink pop-up on the exact same rig that I've been using out there. And this fish is in that ball of weed somewhere, I hope. And it roared off. No, I think it's there, mate. It's gone. Oh, no. That's a heartbreaker. Oh. Get it back out there. No, no back. It's just come off in the weed, and obviously we can't... I thought his head was in the weed as we pulled it out. And that's just come off. After three days of working my socks off, and having a gamble there, just chucking that one rod, I wound it in, went over there, put it on them fizzing fish, little bag of maggots, and uh, it's roared off literally in a few minutes. We just went, and I just can't believe that's come off. I really can't. That rig that I've been using absolutely nails them. And uh, the saving grace was it probably wasn't a big one, because <laughs> I saw it on the surface, but absolutely devastated. I really thought <laughs> that was going to be a nice fitting end to a really, really hard session. Gutted, absolutely gutted. I was just walking down the bank to where I'm casting to see if there are any fish still down there. I saw one drop onto my spot and then my rod went. <laughs> There was a few fish down there, but there was definitely one common of about 20 pound. And it'd be really funny if it was that. I'm here, Dovey. All right. right. Um, I'm just going to move this net the other side here. I was down there watching them. Well, yeah. <laughs> <It was t> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? When you um, get. There was, there was a little. There was a common of about 20 pound and a couple of other ones. Any 40 pound? No, no 40 pounders, no. This isn't the one I thought it was, but he's nice though, isn't he? Look at him. He's a nice fish. So that, that was on a that was on a changer tactic, wasn't it? Yeah, because I, I wanted to fish the chod first of all, which th they've worked really well. So I had them two carp and a massive bream of 17 pound. Um, but I was going to try and get it tight underneath the tree and it's really sort of sandy under there. So I wanted one on the bottom. Um, it's probably only been out there about an hour. Oh, I'll tell you what. It's so exciting though when you can see them in it. Oh, it's don't. Just... There's nothing better. Oh, mate. It's just, That's what yeah, fishing it's should be like all the time. You just yeah. don't get the chance to do it. Fantastic. Stop swimmers now, yeah? Yeah, go on, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking, mate. No, it's always, always nice. We'd, we knew that was our little banker area, wasn't it? That was, if that didn't produce, well, I think we'd both be hanging from trees. And you fished Not it really just well. you. What? Not just you. <laughs> That's, um, I think there's a chance of another one, isn't there, after this? Yeah, I think so. There's a good few hours I've left today. Walk down on the end of that island and there, sort of swimming around the back of the island and then coming back round to my spot. Oh, look at that in that clear water. That's oh, a nice fish, that. That's beautiful. Pretty. That'll please old Tinker. Some of his nice carp getting caught on camera. 
Well, so we, many nice ones in here. It'd be lovely to get stuck into one of the real big ones. Yeah, I'd love to come and fish here, actually, probably, to put my own fish in. Yeah. It's a wicked lake. We wouldn't have said this yesterday, though, would we? No, I think, <laughs> just like you say, mate, that, they, that weed's obviously died off, and a lot of it's floating around, isn't it? Yeah. And that's, you know, I've just seen, I was literally about to tie another zig, because the, what, I've just seen a few swirling me swimming, which is just typical that they're obviously particles of food and that up in the water, and anything that's getting caught is, is shallow. But we've got two of your rigs to, uh, to inspect now. Yeah. Well, this is the one that come from the underwater, so. Yeah? <laughs> All right, mate. So, we're, yeah, you le learn something and put it into practice. There's another fighter jet <laughs> leaving the RAF base. Slightly harder job than me and you have got. <laughs> I don't know. Proper battle this is, isn't it? It's fine. Bet the bites are amazing, aren't they? Mental. Absolutely mental. <laughs> I nearly rip it off the wrist. He's a bit bigger, isn't he? He's got, got like, fatty. Yeah, he is. Definitely been on the pies, that one. On the self-flavoured pies. Oh, he's gorgeous. Yeah, he's just a, keep coming. And she's yours. Well done, lads. Thanks, mate. Nice well stuff. done. Brilliant. Well, look at him, not exactly the common I thought it was. I was down there watching him while I had the bite, but beautiful nunnery mirror carp. I caught him in the shallower water this time, up right on the sand, so I changed the rig from a chod, and we'll um, show you how to tighten it in a little while. It takes a brave man to catch a couple of fish and then change rigs totally. Tom, firstly, you've left the chod, and now you've gone on to a bottom bait or a yeah. critically balanced bottom bait. Any reason for that? Um, just because I thought I was going even closer to the island than I thought was, first of all. Um, so it's really clear and sandy. It is like sand. It's so like I, the Indian Ocean sand, exactly yeah? Exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to put a little bit of a shorter hook link on and something hard on the bottom so it wasn't so blatant. Um, that pop-up's worked well, um, but I thought I wanted to try something different. Right, Dovey, talk me through this rig, because for all intents and purposes, it looks like uh, one that you've used in the past, but yep. I do notice, my old trainer, that there's a little break in the, uh, in the end trap. Is it semi-stiff? Um, it's, uh, yeah, well, it's actually hybrid. Is it? Yeah, it's actually the old hybrid, yeah. So um, it's pretty stiff all the way through, um, and I've just broken a little bit there. Um, so it's got a bit of a hinge to, to hook and catch hold when it goes in the fish's mouth. Okay, so let's t let's talk about how you tie it while I throw it all around the screen. Um, so the first thing you do when you tie this rig, what do you do? Um, I peel off about three or four inches of the coating. Okay. Um, and that's where I tie my hair. Um, so once the hair's tied, there's actually only about an inch, inch and a half of soft, of, of soft braid. Yeah. So you um, always put your bait on before you tie your rig, don't you? Uh, I used to, but I guess it now because I know what I'm putting on there. So. Oh, how um, cool are you, lads? So cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I whip it on six turns anti clockwise around the hook um, and then back through the back of the eye. Um, and then, so obviously, you've just got that soft head and everything else is stiff all the way through. Yeah, so there um, you go, look, hang, hanging down beautifully. Yeah, just like that, yeah. okay? Um, and then, from an inch from the hook, I literally just pull two or three mil of the coating back. You can see it all bunched up there. Yeah, there, just at that pinnacle there of my beautifully made uh, point there. <laughs> yeah, just there. Yeah, so pull it, pull it back, um, and then I'll tie a figure of eight at the other end, probably four or five inches down down the hook link. So it's Why nice a figure short. of eight, Thomas? Um, it just works, it's quick, it's easy, it doesn't break, um, and then just steam it down over the kettle um, so the coating pulls down nice. If you don't steam it with the hybrid, um, you it'll, could. End up, it, it'll end up not cutting through the coating well, and then when you're fighting the fish, it'll cut through quickly and snap the line. Yeah. Um, so you have to make sure you steam it down over a kettle when the little jobs are good in. And it makes, sure, it makes sure it isn't all kinked and looking like a, a curly-whirly rig yeah. <laughs> that you had tied earlier that I saw. <laughs> but yeah, it's lovely, all nice and streamlined. Um, Tom, length of hair. Yeah. What, what sort of uh, is the decisive factor in, in choosing that? 
Um, I, I've always just had it so the, the bait just sort of misses the bend of the hook. Yep, so um, sort of just, just skimming it. Yeah, just biting up against it like that. Um, I don't I, I don't agree with massively long hairs or, or too tight. A, a little bit of movement there. Um, and, and it's not too far away for the bait to go in and, and the hook not. So This is a really, really simple setup, isn't it? Anyone can do it, but I mean, I, I've, I've enjoyed the fruits of this setup over the last couple of years, and, yeah. uh, and I know you have. Do you think it's important that you've got the outturned eye on that chod on that choddy hook? Yeah, definitely, definitely. If, if you've got um, a stiff a, a stiff um, hook link, sorry, um, it, it's really important that you have got that outturned eye because otherwise you've got too much of an angle and the, and the hook link will end up pointing towards the point. Um, so you need that outturn to, to to keep the gate basically of the hook. Okay, onto the hook bait. Um, looks like a little uh, chewed down cell one here, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just a bit of a cell bottom bait, um, and I've got a, an almond pop up on top. All right, lovely to job. Okay, so it just sits if I uh, get the uh, palm of the hand out. You've been using it as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, I've been painting me bivy pink. Um, but yeah, so it just sits like that, does it? Yeah, exactly like that. Okay, and, and how, how sort of fast or slow does this pop up? Um, just like a normal bottom bait. It's not critically balanced. I, d I don't want it wafting around on the bottom. Um, it's, it just sinks slowly enough just to be able to kick away from the lead. Okay, and then are you adding anything to this, like a foam or a bag or anything Always like that? Always a bit of foam, yeah. Just a bit of foam so I know where it's landed, I know it's landed okay. Um, it just makes sure you don't get any tangle. Okay, beautiful. So, onto this bit. Quick link? Yeah, quick link is normal, just to change hook link really quickly. Um, and I've always used that and I don't get tangles because you've got that bit, bit of movement around the swivel. Yeah, little hinge there, kicks everything away. Yeah. And you really do favour stiffer materials, don't you, Tom? Yeah. The semi-stiff or stiff I always use all the time now, um, just because you know it's kicking away from the lead. If you get ejected, look like we know we do 100%, um, you know you're gonna, your, your hook link's going to reset itself and you, you've got a chance of another bite. It always um, comes out fighting, doesn't it? Bobbing yeah, and weaving, yeah. bobbing and Kicking weaving. Otherwise, again. braided hook links land like that, it, and it, sometimes they even get caught up over your leader, mm. don't they? Yeah, there's nothing worse than sitting behind your rods thinking, you know, have I been done? You know, is it, you know, is it tangled? Um, by using that, you know that it's sitting sweet all the time. Beautiful. And then onto the lead system. Obviously now you've got the insurance of a hybrid lead clip, so the yep. lead's going to come off on the fight. Yeah, lead definitely comes off every single time on the hybrid lead clips. Um, I've used them an awful lot. Um, and I've just got about a foot and a half of lead core behind there, just because I know some snags down there. Um, yep. It's just a bit of insurance. Beautiful. Well, there you go. A little change, a little tinker, and the old boy's going to caught another one. Well, Tom, before we head off home to our wonderful lives, a chance to reflect <laughs> on the uh, quite epic last few days. Um, not that many fish. No. Nope. Worked really hard, haven't we? Yeah, we've moved about all over the place, and we even over to the other lake to try and get a bite, but it's, it's been hard going, but come right in the end. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we were just having a chat off camera about the open water areas, you know. Yeah. Uh, I managed to finally get a bite, but you said something quite uh, poignant when you said that um, we just ain't on the right spots. Yeah, they've been here all the time, haven't they? Even like, well, when I walked around, I had a hunch about this side, and we went over that side because they said the swims are good. Um, that's not an excuse, by the way. But um, <laughs> So I've, when, when we was looking over from here, they started showing over here, fizzing, come around here both mornings, didn't we, because we knew that I was over here. Um, they were fizzing, but we didn't get bites. It's just, we, we weren't right on them, that was it. Yeah, well that, that first cast I had, that had a take really, really quickly, yeah. was um, took took a few minutes, didn't it? And I said to you, the drop was different. Yeah. By that, you know, when I felt the lead down, it was a silt drop, but it was slightly firmer. Then when I recast the rod, um, it landed quite a bit softer, I'd say. You know, I went mm. to you, it went, the first one went, uh, the second one went, uh, like that. It was quite distinctly different. We have weird sounds to describe what the bottom feels like. Um, and a little while ago, I just stood in the swim, just having a look out to the left where I'd had the take, and uh, one just bobbed its head out, almost to uh, give me two fingers on the way home. Um, coming back, do you think it's a, it's a case of just not knowing enough about the venue, not being able to sort of predict what's going on in the swim quick enough. Yeah, I don't, I, it's not an easy lake, is it? And I think these places, you, you'd never come down on your recce trip the first time down here and expect to catch carp, would you? So with cameras. With yeah. cameras, yeah, especially. So I think we've done well. I think next time I come down, I think I'd spend more time looking, more time making my own decision on what I want to do um, and making sure I'm in the right spot before I start fishing, you know, not rushing anything. Yeah, absolutely. It's lucky that that sort of left-hand side, that shallow water which held fish, mm. was there as an option because, you know, you fished it well, you have free takes, which I think if someone had offered you free fish before the trip, you would have taken it, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. But um, 
it, like, like you say, it's one spot that was obviously going to do bites. It was shallow water, they were in it, they were feeding. Um, it's one rod, and I almost, you know, I, I wished I'd caught on the other rod because I felt like I would have done it even better. But I have. Absolutely. Well, for more tips and tricks from this series of Thinking Tackle, visit thinkingtackle.com. We're really sorry we couldn't catch you one of those real big ones, but this boy done us proud on that famous left hand rod we keep talking about. Thank you very much for watching, and see you on the bank sometime.